All right, so with the uh, interest of getting to hear as much as possible from our speakers this evening, I'll go ahead and get us started. So good evening, good morning, good afternoon to everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for this webinar, Global Perspectives on Slavery and Freedom on Film. I'm Trish Kaja, Assistant Professor of History here at Georgetown University, Kota. Today's webinar is the final event in a semester long series. So before I get started, I want to just take a few minutes to provide a brief overview of the project and also to thank some of the people who have made it possible. So I organized the series Cinematic Afterlives, Film and Memory in the Black Atlantic with the idea that through cinema, we could foster in GUQ and the broader education city community, an ongoing discussion about narrating, representing and engaging the relationship between past and present, and in particular, the history of slavery and freedom. Today around the Atlantic and the globe, people are reckoning with what it means to live with history. And perhaps the most visible example of this process has been found in debates over public monuments, acts of what I would call radical recontextualization, where protesters change our relationship to history by pulling down monuments to enslavers and colonizers. And though it may be counterintuitive, tearing down a monument can fulfill a similar social purpose to making a film. And indeed, films about slavery and emancipation have been no less urgent. Indeed, some of the films included in the series, like Harriet, have sparked sharp debate among historians and the public alike. In these debates, I see underlying questions of profound significance. How should we remember the past? What is the relationship between our past and our present? How does that we shift over time and what are its promises and perils? How do and should films med mediate the relationship between historical production and political imaginary? These were, and remain urgent questions, not least for me, teaching the history of the Atlantic world at a university still reckoning with its ties to slavery. Of the many ways we might have organized this series of films, it is the product of a particular place, time, and set of conversations with my wonderful students. It is the product of me asking them to engage with the work of thinkers and scholars who have imagined, dreamed of, and fought for Black freedom, while the world around us is replete with mass incarceration, migrant detention, and racist state violence. But historians are not the only ones grappling with such questions. Filmmakers, cast and crew, and audiences all engage in this discussion too, at a site where the stakes of narration are peaked. And so I chose six films that I thought could help us work through these questions. In chronological order of their release, Tomás Gutiérrez Salea's La Última Cena, or The Last Supper from 1976, Julie Dash's Daughters of the Dust from 1991, Roger Gunembala's De Adengamon from 2000, Yeroen Leinder's Tula, The Revolt from 2013, and Kazi Lemon's 2019 biopic, Harriet. And indeed, over the course of these films, several conversations emerged again and again as we came together to discuss as a community. Questions about how claims to freedom were gendered, the centrality of kinship and the resistance of communities across the Black diaspora, the repetitions of visual and narrative tropes, the way that abolitionist politics and the specters of slave revolt could not be contained to a single place or an island or even a country, just to name a few. We ended the series with two films that shifted our conversations in a new direction, Jonas Carpignano's Mediterranean from 2015 and GUQ's own Susie Mergani's El Cit from 2020, that asked us to think about the afterlives of slavery and colonialism, particularly through migration along old slaving routes and to extend our thinking beyond the Atlantic. And although a large group of scholars, including Lisa Lowe, Moon Ho Jung, and Shona Jackson, have all shown us the deep and persistent ties between the enslavement of Africans and other forms of enslavement and unfreedom in the making of the modern world, this complexity has rarely figured as centrally in public memories of these histories. And so these films were an invitation to meditate on the unfulfilled promise of freedom to place ourselves in an unfolding historical process. And so the films in the series have reflected on how we live with history and they offered new points of departure for imagining future liberation. And so tonight we will take this project further in this direction as we bring together scholars of both the Atlantic and Indian Ocean worlds together and engage in dialogue across them. And we will also have an opportunity to reflect on the act of viewing these films from here in the Gulf. Um, but before we dive in, let me go ahead and take a moment just to thank the many people who have been involved in this project and made it possible. So Cinematic Afterlives was generously sponsored by the Center for International and Regional Studies here at GUQ. And I would also like to thank Dean Wilcox for his support of the series. 
And in addition to our speakers tonight, I would also like to thank our film discussants from across the semester. Professor Dana Alwan from Hamid bin Khalifa University, Professor James Hodap from Northwestern University, Qatar, and Professors Robert Carson and Brittany Bounds from Texas A&M University in Qatar. And so um, beyond that, I would also like to thank Heidi and the GUQ events team and Victor and the IT team for making it possible to hold events in line, online and outdoors. Um, and then finally, I would like to extend an especially warm welcome and thanks to uh, my colleagues at Sears, who often did the invisible work that made the series possible and played a critical role in facilitating post-film discussions. So thank you to Sahra Babar for helping me develop the proposal and supporting the series, Ms. Bavati for developing the series' website, Maram Kershi for coordinating the event logistics and planning for literally dozens of eventualities and putting out fires every week, and Liz Wanucha for securing all of the screening rights, and Susie Mergani for pushing me to think more rigorously about film as a form, and for allowing us to show her winning, award-winning short, I'll sit. So without further ado, I'll briefly introduce our speakers for today, and then uh, we'll move on to the panel part of the discussion. So I'll introduce them in the order that we'll speak, and then I'll explain a little bit about how this session will work. Dexter Gabriel is Assistant Professor of History at the University of Connecticut where he is jointly affiliated with the Africana Studies Institute. Broadly, he researches the history of bondage, resistance, and freedom in the Black Atlantic, as well as interdisciplinary approaches to slavery and popular culture and media. His current project examines the impact of emancipation in the Anglo-Caribbean on abolition and ab abolitionism in North America. And in addition to public and scholarly writing on Tarantino's film Django Unchained, he also has a really excellent piece in contemporary French and Francophone studies, translating Trump through a brief history of Black America. Alyssa goldstein Seppenwall is professor of history at California State University, San Marcos, and is a scholar of Haiti and France, as well as slavery and film and video games. She is the author of several books, including Haitian History, New Perspectives, and most recently, um, the fantastic book, Slaver Vault on Screen, The Haitian Revolution in Film and Video Games, which received the honorable mention for the Haitian Studies Association's Biennial Book Prize in 2021. Farisa Vaziri is Assistant Professor of Comparative Literature and Near Eastern Studies at Cornell University, and her research explores the legacies of Indian Ocean slavery from an interdisciplinary perspective. Her project, Racial Blackness and Indian Ocean Slavery, Iran's Media Archive, is forthcoming from the University of Minnesota Press. She is the author of many articles as well, but one that I really recommend for our audience is On Sadia, Indian Ocean World Slavery and Blackness Beyond the Horizon from 2019. And last but certainly not least, Fira Oruch is my colleague here at Georgetown University in Qatar, where he is Assistant Professor of World Literature, specializing in the interdisciplinary intersections between modern world literature, post-colonial literatures, cultural and literary studies of the Middle East, translation, and world cinema. He edited the volume Sites of Pluralism, Community Politics in the Middle East, and also has a fantastic recent article in Film History, Petrocolonial Circulations, and Cinema's Arrival in the Gulf. So thank you again to, uh, for being here with us tonight. I'm really looking forward to this discussion. So with that, I will go ahead and hand it over to Dexter, and I'm looking forward to your remarks. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for having me here. Uh, it's, this is a great topic. Um, glad we're going to get a chance to discuss this, especially in a global perspective. Um, and so I, I suppose I'll start off by just talking a bit about film's impact on me personally and how I came to have an interest in this notion of slavery and film. I'm, I'm old enough so that I remember, um, I was very small at the time, the, uh, the presentation on television of Alex Haley's Roots uh, in 1977. Um, I, was, I, was, I, was, I was a child at the time, however, my parents, uh, uh, Afro-Caribbean migrants who were living in the United States, uh, found it very important that I watch this film. Um, I still remember scenes of that film, though I don't, uh, I, I, I of course didn't understand it mostly at the time, but it was my introduction in many ways to the history of slavery. I don't think before this time, I was so small at the time, anyone had talk to me about slavery, or I, it certainly had not been something that came out in preschool. Uh, and so this was my introduction. In some ways, um, film introduced me uh, to the very topic of slavery. Um, 
and I won't say from then on, interestingly, I was very much interested and I and I delved into it because again, I was I was I was just a little bit out of toddlerhood. And so it would take many years uh, later for me to, you know, as an adult to really become uh, grounded and interested in wanting to research slavery. But there's another point at which uh, I suppose film again entered. And this was as a graduate student. Um, I was a teaching assistant and uh, my professor, I was I she was teaching a course on comparative slavery, and she decided throughout this course, at one point, she's going to show a film. And it was a film, it turned out to be uh, Gil Pantacovo's uh, Quemada, or Burn, uh, which I had never seen before. Um, and which, as I understand it, in fact, I believe it was the film he made directly after uh, the Battle of Algiers, which he's uh, most well known for. Uh, and of course, I was blown away by this film, uh, starring Marlon Brando and an, an unknown actor who is, an, an, pardon me, I forgot his name at the moment, the unknown uh, uh, Black actor who plays the role who's literally discovered on the set uh, for this film. And what, what intrigued me was not only how much this film drew me in as someone who already studies slavery, how much the film drew me in, but how much it drew in the students, how much it drew in uh, people who, students who, you know, gave their various divided attentions throughout the semester, were very much interested in this film, very much wanted to talk about this film. And I suppose from then on was when I said, you know what, I think I want to create a course that looks at slavery and film. Because what I've noticed is that in the United States anyway, um, talking about slavery in public is still something that most people find troublesome. Uh, they still find it very embarrassing, it's a touchy subject. And so it seems, and I've written this before, it seems that because we can't have this national conversation, we've kind of outsourced it to Hollywood. And so uh, I noticed throughout my lifetime that whenever movies or films were made on slavery, they became popular political touch points of discussion. It would be on the, on the weekly news, there'd be articles written about them, right? Um, and it would be something that everyone wanted to have a conversation about. Suddenly everyone wanted to talk about slavery. And so, you know, I set about creating a course where we could do that uh, in the classroom, uh, where we could look at, at, at films on slavery. And I think I came to the understanding of something that you mentioned in the very beginning of your introduction that as historians, we are not the final arbiters on history. Um, and that film plays a very important role of how, um, how people understand the past, uh, whether we like that or not, uh, it is a competitor. And um, I think it's very important for us then uh, to actually talk about films, talk about how films uh, reinterpret history, talk about how they present history, talk about um, in my courses, we talk about communication theory, how we receive and understand mass media, why films may have more of an impact on us uh, than a book or a play or what have you. You know, we talk about films in the United States like Birth of a Nation, um, probably the most famous films, uh, film, fame and film and film history, um, and how Birth of a Nation was first a book and it was a play, and yet it's when it became a film that it took off, right? That it became this phenomenon. So we talk about that. We talk about um, who gets to make film. We talk about the political economy of film, right? Uh, who gets to make films on slavery? Which films are, which films are going to be made? And what, is, what are going to be the themes discussed in those films, uh, which is very important. And which films cannot be made on slavery? And so, you know, I, I think there are, I, I hope that we get to talk about uh, some of that today, because I think when we sit down and we talk about issues of slavery and film, I think it's, I think it's about more than is the film historically accurate or not. In fact, I think that's almost a, that's an interesting part, but it's almost a minor part of what I found interesting. I, what I find more interesting is why was this film made? How do people interpret this film? And what does it tell us is, you know, from my own writing, what does it tell us about this present period we're in? Right, that this particular film is what uh, touches people's imagination, what draws their interest. So I hope we get to talk about some of that today and I'm looking forward to it. Wonderful, I mean, thank you so much. I was really struck uh, about the way that teaching in graduate school is really important for a lot of us because I also learned to teach histories of slavery through film from uh, Julie Seville when I was her TA. Um, and she introduced me to La Ultima Sena, which is now like my favorite film of all time. Um, okay, so I'll go ahead and pass it over uh, to Alyssa. Thank you so much, Professor Kajla, Professor Gabriel, that was wonderful. I only have a little bit of time, so I won't mention it, but Burn was also the first film 
that got me thinking about these issues. Um, so I'm really happy to be a part of this important discussion on slavery, um, film and memory. Um, so I'm gonna talk coming from my vantage point as a Haitian historian. And so um, you asked us, Professor Kajala, to talk about stakes, challenges, and possibilities. So I'm gonna focus on challenges. I'll talk a little bit about stakes and then we'll see if we have time to talk more about possibilities. Um, so um, in my book, Slavery Vault on Screen, I focus on the Haitian Revolution, which was a crucial event in modern history and the first uprising of enslaved Africans in the new world that succeeded in overturning slavery and creating an independent state. But despite its importance, many people outside Haiti have never heard of this revolution. So my book centers around the question, why is the Haitian revolution so obscure? Um, why has its history been silenced? And I argue that its general absence on screen is one reason, linking back also to what Professor Kajla and Gabriel just said. Um, as scholars of film and history have noted, the general public often learns history more from Hollywood than from historians. So I ask, why has Hollywood not made a major film about the Haitian Revolution when there are scores of films, um, scores of epics on other revolutions? I, in fact, discovered many film projects proposed on the subject by big names that did not get funding because studio executives, and I'm looping back to this issue of political economy that Professor Gabriel just raised, studio executives who happened to be, happened to be overwhelmingly white thought that this story of successful revolt by enslaved people would be unappealing to audiences who they also imagined to be white. So that points to the more general issue of what is it about this story of Blacks fighting back to win their freedom against oppression rather than waiting peacefully to be saved by a white hero um, and being successful in doing so um, that has seemed radioactive to Hollywood funders. I think it needs to be said also that we're in a time when even teaching about the history of racism seems threatening to um, certain populations in the US, white populations, who claim that it makes children, meaning white children, uncomfortable. And there are multiple attacks on teaching this history in schools under the guise of banning critical race theory. So the idea of showing retributive black violence against cruel enslavers seems too risky to many executives, a story that white audiences would reject. And when films on slavery are made in Hollywood, I note they generally feature white saviors, such as Brad Pitt rescuing an enslaved man in 12 Years a Slave, or Matthew McConaughey freeing enslaved people twice in Amistad um, or Free State of Jones. So you have this more common genre, what I call suffering slaves waiting for a white hero. So stories on slavery without white heroes and focused on black agency especially when it involves violence, have had difficulty getting funding in Hollywood. Um, when Danny Glover tried to get funding for his proposed film on the Haitian Revolution, producers said, great, great, where are the white heroes? And then would not fund it when they were told it didn't have them. Um, so funding structures are one huge challenge in portraying slavery accurately. Um, and again, this issue of who has the power to green light films is crucial. Um, those who get to choose what gets funded and what goes on screen are generally not the descendants of enslaved people. So the vast wealth disparities that were generated by these very processes, slavery and colonialism, still shape who gets to tell the story of these processes on screen. So if you wondered why can't Haitians just provide alternate depictions on screen of this history of slavery and the Haitian Revolution if Hollywood is not. Um, again, the economic legacies of slavery and colonialism do make it easier for white Americans to make films on slavery than Haitians. But I also want to stress in 2022 that this inequality and thus the challenges of creating alternate depictions are not only in the past. Um, foreign interference by the US included or chiefly continues in 2022 with a puppet regime installed by the US um, as American diplomacy effectively tries to turn Haiti into a sweatshop nation, a source of cheap labor 
and the instability that has been arising in Haiti, especially in the last year, um, under this regime, which Haitians do not like, has increased kidnappings and made filmmaking itself more dangerous. So that some of the Haitian filmmakers that I write about have had to leave the country. Uh, I don't have time to talk about that, but I'll just drop that in there because it needs to be said. So for many reasons, Haitians and other descendants of enslaved people cannot simply provide counter representations to Hollywood's on screen. So against great odds, Haitians have been able to make some films on the revolution, even if they are often low budget and in short film form. And I have two chapters in my book on Haitians' own cinematic depictions of their revolution. But the, the last thing I really want to note before I turn very briefly to stakes is that the problem is not just on the funding end, but also the distribution and consumption end. Many viewers in the US and elsewhere are used to consuming just what is in their local movie theater or streaming what's free on Netflix. They are not accustomed to searching for film festival content and paying uh, sustainable fees for a ticket. So Hollywood representations thus prevail for most people and Haitians and other descendants of enslaved people have difficulty getting others to see their films even when they succeed in making them. So I'll just close with the stakes and, and linking back also to what Professor Kozla said in the opening. The stakes are high because cinema does shape how history is understood by the public, not only in the former enslaving countries, but around the world because of the worldwide reach of Hollywood. And having only negative screen representations of Haitians that are seen widely um, helps facilitate mistreatment of them. As we saw last year, and you may also have seen in, in Qatar, when Haitian refugees were brutalized by US border officials while trying to flee from this puppet regime. So I'll end there. I think that I'm at my seven minutes and I look forward to talking more in the Q&A. Great, thank you so much. Um, and with that, we'll move on to Parisa. Um, we'll go ahead and hand it over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, so first of all, I wanted to thank Professor Kajli for the invitation to be part of this panel. I think my approach to the conversation might be a little bit idiosyncratic. So um, hopefully you'll just bear with me. Um, I thought I would use the opening remarks to introduce the, the project that I'm working on right now. Um, the book project called Racial Blackness and Indian Ocean Slavery, Iran's Media Archive. So in this project, I'm looking at representations of blackness in um, various genres of pre-revolutionary Iranian cinema, including commercial filmmaking, ethnographic filmmaking, um, new wave cinema, and some post-revolutionary film from the 80s. And by representations of blackness, I mean not primarily visual representations, um, and the question of you know what what is blackness in Southwest Asia is already a pretty fraught question, um, but rather a kind of relation to blackness that bears within it a connection to the history of Indian Ocean slavery and more specifically the history of the slave trades from East Africa to the Persian Gulf and Iran. So um, I'll. I'm only really able to focus on one particular aspect of this project, um, ethnographic filmmaking from the 1960s and 70s, and even more specifically one uh, experimental documentary that I've been writing about, um, which is about a healing ritual called Czar. Um, and also because of the, the time constraint, I won't really focus on the context of the film production itself, but rather on the ritual. Um, and be, that's because czar itself has to do with how I'm thinking about relation to blackness as a kind of disruption of our, um, of a certain consensus that underlies normative historical understanding about the past. 
So Zar is a kind of spirit healing ritual um, that's practiced in Iran. It's primarily practiced in the south on the coast. Um, and it's generally treated by anthropologists as a kind of trace of Indian Ocean slavery. In other words, it's thought of as a kind of relic that has been passed down through generations of the descendants of enslaved people. Um, and versions of it are practiced throughout Southwest Asia, Southeast Asia, North Africa, East Africa. Um, and there's, there's a little bit of um, discussion about the direction of the movement, the diffusion of Tsar, but there is a general consensus that it originates in the African continent and then kind of spreads through Southwest Asia, later combining with various um, religious and spiritual elements elsewhere. So for example, there's no geographical border between East Africa and Southwest Asia, but there are very clear similarities between the way that this ritual is practiced in both regions. So the basic framework of Zar is therapeutic. Oh, sorry, I just wanted to make sure no one was sending me a message on the chat. Um, the basic framework of Zara is therapeutic, but it encompasses an, an entire cosmology of belief about um, the existence of spirit winds that inhabit the body and create psychic or physical ailment. So when an individual is psychically or physically ill and um, they go to a doctor and you know, within the framework of Western medicine, the illness can't be diagnosed, um, the individual might see a czar adept or a diviner and then it's the, a decision is made about whether or not the the individual is afflicted by a wind or not um, one of the central aspects of this ceremonial structure is music and in particular drumming um, which is true of other uh, spirit rituals that are practiced in north africa um, like gnawa which is you know, popular in Morocco and Stambeli in Tunisia, and, you know, which are also considered relics of uh, the trans-Saharan slave trades. So the, the drumming is accompanied by incantations, and um, during, the, during the playing of the drumming and the incantations, the person who is afflicted might begin moving or dancing, and through the particular ways in which they're moving, the diviner um, will identify the specific wind that's been afflicting the individual. And it's, it's not, it's different from exorcism in that the ceremony is not intended to remove the spirit from the body, but rather to um, negotiate a relationship, which is considered to be a, a lifelong relationship. So I'm thinking of Tsar, um, the reason I spent so much time just explaining it as a kind of anthropological object is because I'm interested in it, not only as a modality of healing, but as a register of historical memory um, that conflicts with our traditional expectations of coherence and legibility. So in these healing rituals, there's a kind of self-fragmentation that occurs, which culminates in entry into trance. And this is probably the most important dimension of the, the ritual is that the individual will enter a state of trance. So one can think about this entry into trance, not merely as a state of being occupied, by a spirit, but as a kind of emptiness, an experience of emptiness. And um, it's true that a lot of ethnographic data about these rituals will report back that participants experience, describe their experience as a kind of amnesia or forgetting. Um, so I'm interested in Tsar um, methodologically as uh, a phenomenon that articulates questions about the way we think about consciousness and subjectivity, um, the models of consciousness and subjectivity that underlie the way we think about historical experience. Um, and, and so my wager is that um, taking seriously the phenomenon itself might have consequences for the way that we think about something like the construction of historical facts, for example. 
So according to our dominant logics of historical, well, according to our dominant logics, historical fact is constructed on um, or based upon the existence of material evidence of archives, um, agreed upon interpretations of evidence, sometimes testimony, um, and as a consequence, our procedure for constructing historical facts doesn't really take into account the possibility of something that might exist in time that would be fundamentally disinclined toward inscription um, or self-preservation. So what, what cannot exist as or what cannot be preserved as an object can't really be part of history in a sense. So I'm curious about the ways that Indian Ocean slavery as it's embodied by the recorded transmission of Tsar actually eludes our demands for historical representation um, and knowledge. So we tend to assume historical intelligibility which is usually translated as narrative intelligibility um, as an intrinsic good, right? An intrinsic good and intrinsic necessity. Um, but can there be a kind of historical memory that is not the memory of something, um, but more like the transmission of an absence? So, you know, then moreover, how do we think about the therapeutic aspect of this transmission? and the therapeutic dimension of this absence? These are the kinds of questions that I'm asking. Wonderful. Um, I think there's a lot of resonances, certainly, with the literature from the Atlantic world and what you've said. Um, all right, so Fira, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you, and then we'll, after that, we'll move into our discussion. Uh, thank you, uh, Trish, for uh, inviting me to join this uh, panel. Uh, uh, which also gives me a, a, an opportunity to, uh, and probably the for the first time, uh, bring my two interests in film studies and Indian Ocean uh, studies together in and in comparison with uh, the cinematic afterlives of uh, uh, slavery in the Atlantic. Um, so uh, let me share my screen first, please. I feel that I, uh, I over prepared, so I'm not going to attempt to go over all my uh, slides, but uh, as an opening, uh, uh, in the opening round, I would like to, uh, ra perhaps rather than uh, sticks, I use the word passages in uh, thinking about the comparative global perspectives on slavery and freedom on film. And uh, the first one is obviously from the Atlantic to the Indian Ocean. Uh, the second from the recorded archive to the moving image. And the third from memories of lived experience to film. And I think especially on the Next two issues, uh, Parisa uh, already uh, offered us some uh, reflections uh, about the uh, the the first uh, sort of point of passage. Uh, I think maybe that's for us uh, now uh, a solved question, but probably not as much. But uh, in um, the Atlantic, uh, the Atlantic has been seen as kind of the designated birthplace of capitalist modernity as a transnational system, which draws in the African slave trade, American plantation economies, and the European industries that this enabled. And by contrast, right, uh, the Indian Ocean in sort of conventional historiography, and, and so on has basically been relegated to a pre-modern timeless zone uh, uh, in contrast uh, uh, with uh, the modernism of the capitalist uh, Atlantic. And um, so uh, I, I think it is important for us in thinking comparatively to be 
um, sort of uh, cautious against any derivative relationship between the Atlantic and Indian Ocean uh, slaveries. Uh, it, it would be uh, uh, quite a, a fallacy to treat Indian Ocean slave trade as a kind of smaller scale mirror image, right? And uh, I think in terms of method, I'm uh, sort of inspired by uh, uh, Ashley Cohn's um, concept of the two Indies uh, as an oceanic, what she calls oceanic metageography. Uh, and uh, this uh, offers us uh, a, uh, I mean, it invokes the 18th century concepts of the Indies and uh, uh, tries to uh, sort of revive it as a critical uh, hermeneutic uh, to, uh, to think uh, the Atlantic and the Indian Ocean regions uh, is a single form of uh, analysis. And uh, I think uh, as a comparatist, uh, the, the two in this model uh, uh, can be supported uh, with what um, uh, Edward Said uh, earlier, but later uh, scholars uh, such as Shu Meishi and, and others uh, have uh, theorized as a relational and contrapuntal comparison, right? Uh, which is based on a recognition of overlapping and intertwining colonial and global uh, ge uh, economic uh, geographies that makes clear that neither the Atlantic nor the Indian Ocean operated as closed maritime worlds. Uh, in terms of a sort of cinematic expressions of that, I feel that uh, uh, Coolitude uh, films uh, are a very uh, important cinematic afterlives of uh, the two Indies. Right? Uh, Coolitude is an aesthetic reconstruction of the fragmented memories of the transoceanic journeys of coolies as both, both forced migration and a set of uh, cultural encounters. And some of the films that I have in mind, uh, more recent ones, uh, uh, Michel Mohaber's Queer Coolitudes, um, Ian Har uh, Narin uh, doubles with Slight Pepper, um, Sumati Sivamohan Here and Now, uh, and Richard Fa Funk's uh, Dalpuri uh, Diaspora. And, uh, there are a couple of uh, other uh, examples as well. Now, uh, on the question of from the archive to the moving uh, image, uh, I have thought, and this is really experimental, uh, uh, thinking, uh, 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 bringing together uh, uh, Sadia Hartman's uh, uh, no, uh, concept of uh, critical fabulation which, uh, and Tarkovsky's uh, uh, sculpting in time vision. Uh, uh, critical fabulation as defined by Hartman, a reading of the archive that mimes the figurative dimensions of history by playing with and rearranging the basic elements of the story to imagine what might have happened or might or might have been said, or might have been done, and to make visible the production of disposable lives. Uh, sculpting in time, uh, uh, on, uh, on the other hand, uh, or in addition, as Tarkovsky defines it, is the primary material, uh, uh, he writes, the primary material with which the filmmaker works is blocks of time imprinted onto strips of celluloid. The filmmaker captures, shapes them, and releases them in the act of projection. And uh, I, so some of you may remember uh, this uh, still shot uh, from Tarkovsky's mirror that he uh, uses the Spanish, uh, uh, some footage from Spanish uh, Civil War uh, uh, newsreel, and this is a, uh, the this girl 
is a uh, is a refugee uh, just arrived in in Russia, and Tarkovsky sort of using the footage gives a, a kind of a life, some a expression, the fear of war, and and so on, and. For me, uh, one uh, uh, Indian Oceanic example uh, comes uh, from uh, the work uh, of uh, uh, Eleanor Dayel, uh, considered uh, uh, probably one of the first uh, uh, British uh, um, uh, um, uh, uh, experts in the, in the Gulf uh, to have used um, uh, uh, the movie uh, camera, and uh, uh, these are like two still shots uh, that I felt uh, could uh, be uh, sort of in uh, just ex uh, in uh, examples uh, as uh, as an exercise for us uh, toward uh, critical uh, fabulations in the. Uh, film archives or, uh, uh, of slavery in the Indian uh, Ocean. One more point, and I promise I will stop. Uh, I also thought about uh, Ensign Kos, the probably one of the most important uh, scholars of the Indian Ocean migration and diaspora. His his uh, really important article. Uh, uh, titled um, Inter-Asian Concepts for Mobile Societies. And I feel that in thinking uh, about uh, the Indian Ocean context, uh, uh, probably uh, we need a vision or a, a theorization of mobile images for Indian Ocean uh, mobile societies, right? Those as he writes, uh, uh, those smaller, mobile, less integrative societies have become difficult to see because the notion of society that has been created by enlightenment theory focuses on the internal, internal constitution of large encompassing aggregates. Such aggregates banish the external and the outside to a realm beyond the pale, outside the core, understanding of society. And in relation to that, uh, one, I think, important uh, cinematic exercise uh, that we could engage is, uh, borrowing his terms, is uh, disaggregation and re-aggregation of the moving image uh, archives. Right? And the example uh, I have in, in mind is uh, Khalid Siddiq's uh, The Cruel Sea, which is considered the first uh, feature film made in the Gulf. And uh, uh, as you can see, he, wor he worked uh, with uh, a female uh, 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 trooper, uh, all of whom uh, have a slave uh, genealogies. But the film uh, has been celebrated as uh, part uh, is uh, uh, national cinema uh, as a history of of the uh, birth of the Kuwaiti nation and, and so on. Right? Uh, and finally, circularities and their uh, cinematic uh, afterlives. Uh, that's again in conversation with uh, Ensign Ho. Uh, he writes. Circulations of peoples cross the trans-regional axis that straddle the Indian Ocean are thick and historically continuous. In the early 20th century period of colonialism, one-way migration swamped these circulations. But today, the circulations are back as migrant workers are denied long-term or permanent residences and have to return home. And the cinematic uh, sort of counterpoint point to uh, Ensign Ho, I would say, is uh, this really fascinating work by camps uh, from Gulf to Gulf to Gulf, which is uh, a collaboration with migrant sailors on a sound installation and, uh, and documents the Gulf with footage set to devotional and film uh, Hindi popular film songs. Uh, I'll stop here. 
uh, and maybe in the Q and A session, I will insert a bit of my material. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you so much. I think those were all really fascinating points of departure. Um, and there, I was furiously scribbling down notes. And so I know I had already circulated some questions. I'm going to do my best to try and combine the two a little bit. Um, but I thought it might be worthwhile, especially sort of looking at the films you were showing us about, right? Where there's more of a direct overlap, right? Between the time that is slavery and the time that is the film being made um, is a lot closer than that is in the Atlantic side. And so, um, you know, I think going back to something Dexter had said was that the, the films are mirrors of the present in which they are made, right? And so how would the region that you work on, whether that's thinking of it in terms of a basin, in terms of a particular linguistic world, um, how would that conceive of what the present actually is? Um, and uh, sort of how does that shape the way maybe we think about seeing slavery on film? Uh, I'll, I'll take the first stab at this, um, just since you mentioned I brought it up, but certainly uh, in my study of slavery, uh, primarily in the United States, I think what you see is, um, especially in, in the study of American slavery, uh, and what, what you see is like, you see, this er you see this turn through time. If you look at the advent of cinema with films like Birth of a Nation uh, in the early 1900s, they're very lost cause. Uh, that is this notion that, you know, that the Confederacy and fighting the Civil War uh, had been a noble cause that, enslaved people were content and docile, um, that there were no real insurrections or anything of the sort. Certainly the Haitian Revolution doesn't even make it in as a, as a concept that anyone has heard of, much less any rebellions in the United States. And so you, you see these first films and this is pretty much what they pertain to. And this has much to do with the popular narrative of the time um, when Birth of a Nation comes about. You see it through uh, films that are done by child stars like Shirley Temple, where uh, she is, you know, there are these stereotypes uh, of the uncle or what have you, and the mammy uh, probably reaches its apex with, um, of course, uh, Gone with the Wind, uh, the famous American film in 1939. Uh, and what you see is this is the dominance, but you do see a shift uh, with the coming of the civil rights movement, with the coming of the black protest movements in the United States. You begin to see a new type of film come about. Um, and these have their own criticisms. Uh, some of these films are, will fit into the exploitation narrative or what become known as black exploitation. And so in these films, the black characters suddenly all turn very rebellious, but almost, almost caricature-like. Um, and it almost seems as if they're, they're trying to recreate the Black Panthers that they are seeing uh, in real time. They're trying to recreate this through the filmic uh, individuals. In fact, I remember, I remember there's a film called Mandingo um, where the uh, slave rebel, uh, his speech sounds much more like Bobby Seale was making it uh, than anyone uh, who had existed in the 19th century. And so, I mean, you bring this forward, if you look at Roots, uh, you know, this is an era where it's a post-civil rights movement. Uh, African-Americans want to be seen as middle-class, you know, um, part of society and Roots uh, pretty much does this. It's almost a bizarre immigrant story when of course uh, African-Americans, it, it's very, it would be very hard to call uh, the arrival of African-Americans in the United States uh, an immigrant story. And yet it has these themes, right? People who are struggling, hardworking, and eventually they make it within society. And so we see these themes playing out. And I, I guess what you end up seeing, if you'd ask me like, what's going on with uh, the more modern films. I think they also reflect um, what I've seen is a need to, in many ways, show several things. One, uh, there's a need to show that uh, there are enslaved people who are rebellious. I think you especially see this in films like, for instance, Django uh, Unchained, where the Black characters are extremely rebellious, uh, heavily masculine, uh, by the way, uh, they play the music, the, the film itself uses a hip hop soundtrack as if to show we are definitely blending time periods. Um, you also have films that want to show the brutality and horrors of slavery, um, which has led to controversy, by the way, controversy that people like Sadia Hartman and others have talked about with scenes of projection, but 
when you uh, show film ideas of brutality, at what point do we enter forms of exploitation and voyeurism and what have you? But there's certainly uh, a, a desire to see that in films. You see this with films like 12 Years a Slave and others, the people who wish to show this brutality and wish to show the truth of slavery. And so I think, I think what's, what's interesting now, I would say, is that if you were to say what's happening in the modern era, is that we do have a diversity of type of films. Like, I don't think we live anymore where there are just plantation epic films and there are just these black exploitation films. I think we are getting uh, a diverse amount of filmmakers. Uh, for the first time, we're having a good number of filmmakers of people who are descended from enslaved people who are making films. Um, this was, you know, uh, and I think we've been seeing this since Julie Dash, right? If you want to say Julie Dash and then moving forward to someone like Steve McQueen with 12 Years a Slave, we're beginning to see more black filmmakers though, as, uh, as, as I think uh, Alyssa well pointed out, uh, this doesn't always work with Donald Glover, for instance, Danny Glover, for instance, wanting to create a film on the Haitian revolution and being told there are no white heroes, it still is hard to do. And so you still see black filmmakers today trying to make films on slavery, but running against that wall. So what I've noticed, uh, if anything, what some are doing is being a bit more creative. And I think this is where we get the Jordan Peels and we get out. Uh, get out is practically a neo-slave narrative. It, it has so many themes of slavery in it. It, it drops these words like the, the stereotype of the bucks and what have you. There's literally a slave auction. What you're finding are filmmaker, black filmmakers who are saying, look, we can't do it this way. If you're not going to give us the money that you gave Steven Spielberg to make the Amistad, then we'll find another creative way to do it. And so we're now seeing films like, I just saw one, uh, Antebellum, for instance, which talks about this. There's a film called Alice, where it tries to blend the past and the present. And so what I found interesting about these is that they are very much, when I talk about slavery being a bit of our present, they're very much films about slavery that are set in the present. And they try to show how the legacies of slavery live with us today, sometimes literally through forms of hauntings, uh, through speculative fiction uh, and through basically the surreal. But I think that's what I'm seeing today, at least from black filmmakers. And I do wonder if going forward, um, we're going to see uh, more versions of Harriet, as you pointed out, which are looking at the historical past. Or if we're going to start seeing films that are instead going to be these films that are much more about the present that refer to slavery and bring them into the narrative. So it'll be interesting to see where we're going forward. I can jump in on this one also. That was so interesting, Dexter. Thank you very much for all of that. Um, coming from memory studies to film and not from film studies, I've written other books, but this is my first on film. I bring that lens of thinking about, right, why are films made? So let me just briefly mention, I think, three moments, because again, I study the absence of Haitian Revolution and slave revolt films in addition to the moments in which they were made. So Hollywood's only film that really is directly on the Haitian Revolution um, is a film called Lydia Bailey, which came out in 1952 from Fox and has been almost entirely forgotten. So I have a chapter in my book on why was this film made? And I argue that it's part of this moment in post-war United States um, where on the one hand, there's a push from the Truman administration for civil rights after African-American soldiers, I should say, a push from African-Americans to the Truman administration that the Truman administration says, okay, I, I definitely need to talk about it that way, um, where after African-American soldiers gave their lives um, in the fight against the Nazis, they didn't want to come home and, and face the same segregated world. So working with the film studios, the administration helped push the idea that there should be um, social me message pictures or race pictures that started to break down um, racist ideas. So Lydia Bailey was part of that and also part of this idea in the post-war United States that the US should become the friend of countries that were becoming independent. Um, and so you've got that mapped onto, right, that the U.S. should be now the ally of countries that are shedding off the French or the British. Um, and in this um, interesting storyline, which was based on a novel, you've got this American who goes to Haiti and ends up helping Toussaint Louverture 
um, in the Haitian Revolution. But then that gets forgotten afterwards once the civil rights movement starts accelerating and you have more white Americans who start to get afraid um, of black violence. A second moment in France, there's been a reluctance to grapple with the um, past of slavery in, in France and its empire. And so I study this film called Toussaint Louverture, which was a mini series put on French TV in 2012. And I look at this film as a kind of war and I talk a little about the complicated production history of this film between people who said, let's talk about slavery and people who said, it is racist to say that whites were racist. And you cannot say that, you know, they were slaveholders and they were mean and the film instead shifts. It, it, it makes Haitians kind of the villains and in being ingrates and wanting to fight back against their nice slave owners. Um, and then the, the third moment I think is Oscar So White. Oscar So White started to create momentum to start green lighting some films um, like Harriet. Um, but the last thing I'll say doubling back to what Dexter said, and I noticed that my friend, Professor Phil Kaiser is in the audience and he's also a historian um, of slavery and film. And he is the first one who told me about Chris Rock's film Top Five. Um, which I study. And so top five coming out in 2014, a few years before the Oscar So White movement got bigger was Chris Rock's um, attempt to talk in a comedy film about how you can't make a film about the Haitian revolution or slave revolt in Hollywood. So that's again, this kind of other creative way when, and, and he had to still fund the film himself um, rather than it being something that came out of studio. But in, in short, I think there are these different moments when we have films and then they go away. If I may uh, join the uh, conversation uh, from the Indian Ocean. And I think uh, I, in a way we are, uh, or in filmmaking in the Indian uh, Ocean uh, littoral world uh, probably is lucky that uh, that it doesn't have a uh, sort of hegemonic dominant film industry such as Hollywood. So all the, you know, all the uh, uh, industry demands and, uh, and, and so on are probably, uh, there is some liberating element there, uh, the fact that they are uh, absent. But, uh, and Alisa in her own, remark had mentioned the festival circuits, uh, right? And that's indeed a constraint. Uh, most of these uh, young filmmakers have to rely on funding uh, from uh, various, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, funding agencies usually located in Europe or in uh, the uh, sort of uh, new uh, Gulf uh, Film Institutes, Doha Film Institute included, uh, and, and, and so on. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, that it, while it is an opportunity, you always also feel that they have to cater uh, the language, the representation, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, for the festival audience to make it look like an art house film and, and so on. Um, so I wanted to add this. Yes, oh, so maybe, uh, of, sorry, uh, of course, there are some who sort of get the funding and they do something totally different. Uh, Parisa may know this example, the Tales of Kish was authorized by the tourism authority of the island to promote tourism. And uh, Nasir Tagwai and uh, Mohsin Mahbelbaf and others, they did exactly the opposite to particularly draw attention to the uh, ecological and human uh, impacts of uh, uh, tourism on, on the Gulf Islands. Sorry. Yeah, um, I, I don't know, uh, Professor Kajla, if you wanted to move on to another question or if I can also um, try to respond to this question. So um, yeah, it's up to you. <laughs> 
I think it's really generative. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Okay, yeah, yeah, because um, Farad brought up uh, Nasser Taghbayi, and actually the film that I was talking about in my opening remarks is a, another film by Nasser Taghbayi that was made in the late 60s, um, the experimental documentary about Czar. Um, and, you know, in relation to the question of how films about slavery tend to be reflections or meditations on the present, um, well, first of all, I should kind of disclose that the films that I engage are not representations of slavery in the sense that we think about the term representation. They're not direct kind of meditations on slavery. And in particular, that experimental ethnography um, what was striking um, to me for a number of different reasons. But first, I'll just address the, the question itself. Um, part of my interest in ethnographic filmmaking of this time period is also connected to the evolution of cinematic modernism in Iran, um, which is sort of emblematized by the figure of the new wave. And so there's this kind of deep connection between ethnographic documentary and the emergence of new wave cinema. And part of that has to do with this new political consciousness about image making that's emerging globally really in the 1960s. Um, and there is a certain kind of commitment to realism in these films. Um, because it's thought that a sort of direct access to reality through film will sort of somehow wake the spectator up um, from the, the slumber of what the, I think it's important also to situate Iranian filmmaking within its own context. So the dominant sort of mode of commercial filmmaking in the 50s and 60s was um, this a term called film farsi. It's a, it was a derogatory term for commercial filmmaking of the time period, but it was mostly sort of um, melodramatic, um, very hyperbolic escapist plot lines that were not very accurate reflections of what was going on sociopolitically during the time period. So um, these more sort of politically conscientious, conscientious filmmakers who formed part of the new wave and were also involved simultaneously in ethnographic documentary um, were, were interested in what kinds of political potentials there, there could be in filmmaking. So part of the connection that I'm exploring between ethnography and the new wave is in relation to an articulation of a critique of modernity. And, and that is where I do think there is a relationship between the kind of phenomenon that Taghvai was trying to document with these documentaries about the South of Iran, um, communities of African slave descendants and czar. Um, and it's the way in which czar sort of generates language for a certain kind of critique of modernity that not only filmmakers at the time were interested in expressing, but writers um, and sort of various kinds of, you know, anti-colonial activists and thinkers. Um, but what's particularly interesting about that to me is that even though in a way, Indian Ocean slavery, because it's thematically connected to the very fact of the presence of these African Iranians who are living in the South, um, it's present in the film, but it doesn't rise to the level of becoming an object of redress. It, it doesn't really rise to the horizon of redress for um, the kinds of dissatisfactions that filmmakers were otherwise um, eager to articulate about modernity. And I mean, I, I can say more about that in relation to the way that I, I think that Indian Ocean slavery is both connected to modernity, but also sort of disconnected from it in, in a way that makes its temporality very difficult to capture um, in a straightforward way. Thank you so much. I think these are all sort of 
pushing me to try and think about what I what I want sort of where I would like to take the direction next. And I think I'm going to actually just shift into a second set of tensions, right? So we just thought about the relationship between past and present. And now I may be taking up um, this sort of move from you. I'd like to think about the relationship between the two sort of ocean worlds as they've been constituted. Um, because again, someone I'm trained as a historian of the United States. Um, and so my education about what the history of slavery was, was extremely Atlantic focused. And it's been really being here that has really forced me to think much more in terms of connection, right? With getting many different sets of questions uh, from my students with sort of being able to engage with a wider set of colleagues and read a larger set of literature. And so I think we could maybe take up two pieces. So one would be thinking about you know, we you think about comparison versus connection and sort of what are some of the challenges of actually putting these kinds of film archives in conversation with each other, given that as we've seen here, right, they are sort of taking up different questions, um, sort of moving in sort of different cinematic modes. Um, and then also thinking about what might the other region learn from the other to the extent that you're sort of familiar with the, the sort of themes that have come up from the other basin in the discussion so far. I'll just throw out that I think it is, I, I was frozen for a moment, worthwhile to think about these connections. And I appreciate very much what Professor Audich said um, on this issue. Um, of course, there was Indio, in Indian Ocean slavery also at the time in the early modern period um, of Atlantic slavery, if we're talking about the French colonies, for instance. So one of my friends, Professor Sue Peabody at Washington State University is currently working on a film um, I think they have a, a cut um, on a historical figure that she studied named Fursi, who moved um, from different places from the in French Indian Ocean colonies to the metropole, to the Caribbean. So there are definitely stories like that that we can try to recover. I don't know about any, I shouldn't say there aren't any. I'm not familiar with right now films about slavery in Reunion, um, or in Maurice or any of the French colonies, but certainly we can bring these um, histories that were coterminous into closer dialogue with each other. I mean, I think just sort of this is a, a relatively factual question that I just am not sure about, but I was also trying to like rack my brain for representations of contract workers and unfree South and East Asian laborers in the Caribbean, for example, and they don't have the same kinds of prominence um right that we have even of the sort of you know trans-regional connections which are also themselves much more muted in a lot of the films um than they are in the historical record but um we also uh have time for maybe sort of one more point of departure and then i'll shift to the audience questions and here i think it's really sort of a a question about what you would the film you would like to see made so right if this is like if you could commission a film about a particular story or theme place uh revolt um you know what would that film be and it doesn't as i think you know dexter you were saying right it doesn't necessarily need to be the sort of plantation epic or a, a film about slavery per se but a film that would ask us to engage this history in a new way what would it be for you um, I'm probably going to take Steel and Liz's Thunder because you, you know what I, <laughs> you know what I want to see. I would want to see definitely. I'm talking a sweeping epic on the Asian revolution. You can't, no way you can turn a 13 year uh, <laughs> engagement of rebellion to revolution. I would love to see something that comes out. Perhaps it, perhaps uh, in our era of streaming, it needs to be something that is on uh, within television. It could have different seasons if it has you, but I, I would love something, I mean, massive, uh, that really speaks to complexity. I'm teaching a class right now on the Asian Revolution. And what my students are always struck by was like, okay, this was, this was complex. This was not, there are so many names to like, you know, there's so many names for them to learn. There's so many different things that happen, so many twists and turns where no one can see where this is going until you know it reaches its conclusion. I would, I would love to see something like that. And then somehow or the other, we end up with Christoph's, uh, we ended with Christoph's uh, large uh, fortress uh, there in the mountains. But I just wanted, I'm sorry for the prior question, uh, a film that might bridge a bit of East and West. There's an 1830, there's a film called 1838, I think it's called Guyana, 1838. 
and it's supposed to be about uh, East Indian indentured servitude, but they link it the themes of slavery and unfreedom, uh, and it's supposed to link. Uh, and I don't know if this is a this is an interesting way to uh, link both, but it speaks of South Asian migrants uh, being taken to Guyana and talks about the abuse uh, that they endure. I, I cannot. It's very it's very low budget film. Uh, like literally, I saw it on Daily Motion, one of those, but. It's called uh, it's called 1838. So perhaps there we're seeing the beginning of some of these uh, conversations. But I'll step away. I'm sorry, Liz, I had to say it because I've, I've long wanted. <laughs> no, I'll, and I'm going to jump in and I'll say that's great. And again, there's there's this grassroots desire for a film on the Haitian Revolution. So one thing I like to tell people is that there are some by Haitians, but they're not epics, of course. So of course, I'd also love to see an epic on the Haitian Revolution. But one thing that I argue in my book is that I want to see Haitian participation in it. And I got a, in a little bit of trouble. One of my friends just reviewed my book and he liked it in general, but he was, my friend is Jamaican, Professor Matthew Smith. And he thought, why should this story just belong to Haitians? But I feel that there's been a lot of exploitation of Haitians. And there's been this turn to embracing Haitian history without helping Haitians, while Haitians are still suffering from our foreign policy. And there are Haitian um, filmmakers and creative artists. So if there's something streaming on a service, I think it should have to be done in participation with Haitians. It makes me uncomfortable if it's not. But I also argue that there should not just be one Haitian revolution film, but there should be dozens. And I see this from the perspective of someone who also studies film and the Holocaust. There should not just be one story. People had so many different experiences in enslavement. And as um, Professor Gabriel said, the Haitian Revolution is so complicated. So yes, that's the dream I have is not just one single film, but a world in which there can be um, lots of them. I think. Uh... You know, in terms of to uh, of your uh, uh, early, early uh, question about uh, films that uh, uh, make uh, representational uh, connections across the Indian Ocean and uh, the Atlantic, I mentioned the you know re more recent Cooley Toot uh, films, but in a sort of a, a probably a more famous one and probably more accessible one is uh, Mira Nair's Mississippi Masala. That's a classic there. Uh, it's interesting, I, uh, you know, uh, I think I also share the same, uh, in terms of the films, I think we are all in the same desire of uh, uh, film uh, emancipatory visions. And, uh, from uh, you know what I have been looking at, uh, there are two uh, recently exciting uh, films of the uh, of uh, sort of memorializing uh, uh, past uh, uh, slave uh, revolts and anti-colonial uh, struggles. That's. Uh, uh, the the this one from uh, Madagascar, uh, Fahavalo uh, Mad centers on the Madagascar uh, 1947 uh, uh, revolt, and uh, an earlier one uh, by the Algerian uh, French uh, film director Tariq uh, Tigua uh, uh, on uh, the Zanj revolution, thinking about the Arab Spring in contrapuntal relationship with the probably the most well-known and uh, impactful uh, black slave revolution uh, in the uh, during the Abbasid uh, 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 empire in Basra so I'll this would be uh, my current choices <laughs> Um, and I, I, I'll just chime in with also with regard to the last question about the connections. And in a way, I think references to Indian Ocean slavery are always also connected to transatlantic slavery history. Um, and one example of that is, is again with this um, experimental documentary 
I, I mentioned, I think when I was introducing it, that there were many different ways that I was thinking about this particular film and I, I could not you know, address all of those ways, but another reason has to do with precisely the way that it's capturing the complexity of the temporality of Indian Ocean slavery. So um, one fact is that the, this filmmaker actually made two different documentaries about Tsar. Um, and this time it was in a different island in the Persian Gulf. Um, but he, there was something sort of unsatisfying about the first documentary. For whatever reason, he went back and made a second one. And the second one is a lot more like a traditional ethnographic documentary in that the narration is very sort of direct and clear and, and delivering um, plain facts, right, about this community. And there is a moment in the narration where the filmmaker who's doing the voiceover says, um, he makes a reference to the fact that the inhabitants of this island are descendants of enslaved Africans. So one of the things that is striking to me about the, the sort of these twin documentaries is that the documentary that gives this more kind of above board narration about the community there, its relationship to slavery, it sort of just disappears from film history. Nobody knows about this film. It's like impossible to find this film. The documentary that sort of gets canonized within the history of Iranian film is the more experimental abstract documentary in which there's no direct um, narration about the relationship between enslavement and this ritual. And I was always curious, you know, what is it about the more abstract experimental version of the documentation of this phenomenon that gets sort of inscribed in history and it won numerous awards at the time. Um, it, it does that itself sort of indicate something about a resistance to confronting the facticity of Indian Ocean slavery? Like what is it about the facticity of Indian Ocean slavery um, that makes it so amenable to abstraction and that also creates this kind of resistance to receiving it in a more straightforward traditional way? Like these are the facts, this is what happened. Part of that I think has to do again with its temporality, its duration. So, you know, there was reference to French slavery, um, the Mascarene Islands. There are aspects of Indian Ocean slavery, of course, that are modern, like just exclusively modern, right? But there are also other aspects, other dimensions of Indian Ocean slavery that go back to antiquity and really in a way to prehistory. We don't have any sense of the origin, um, for example, of the slave trades between East Africa and the Persian Gulf. We have so... Um, limited archival materials for the pre-modern period, which is why all of the information we do get is concentrated in the modern period. But that creates this kind of distorted sense that the only part of the history of Indian Ocean slavery that mattered was its modern iteration. Actually, it's the fact that we just don't have access to its antiquity. Um, so this the, the connection, I think, um, and, and feel free to cut me off if, if we're running out of time. I know there are other questions we want to get to. Um, but just I'll wrap up really quickly. There's a moment where in the same documentary, the experimental documentary, there's a reference to um, not... Um, okay, so there is, there is a direct reference to slavery, but it's delivered in a very oblique way. Um, typical of Persian language. It's like, you know, meaning prior to the arrival of the Blacks, meaning the Blacks on the island, for the cause of dates. This is a very enigmatic phrase because it could really be referring to any time period. But in a way, there's also something specific about dates and date plantation slavery. Um, that that's connected to the 19th century, and there's you know been recent scholarship that's sort of trying to destabilize this image of Indian Ocean slavery as 
um, a history of non-productive slave uh, labor that you know was was completely disconnected from say new world forms of chattel slavery and agricultural slavery um, and and so but with this phrase there's this enigmatic reference to both its modernity and simultaneously like what is there's there's not really a specificity right to that it's sort of um, the spectator has to make their own conclusions about what that means. What does it mean to come here for the cause of dates? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll. Great. Yeah, I mean, those are all really fantastic. I think uh, I'll make my pitch because obviously the there are lots of film executives, future film executives, maybe in our audience today. I really would love to see a dramatization of the Freedmen's Bureau from the perspective of freed people. I'm thinking of like the documents collected by like Ira Berlin, like Major Delaney, and then the, the freed people of Edisto Island. Um, I think they're like, we're begging for a good reconstruction movie. Um, similarly epic in proportions, right? But um, with that, let's go ahead and shift over to uh, the comments and questions here in the chat. And so um, maybe we'll, uh, we'll start with uh, these questions here towards the bottom. And so we have uh, from the early 2000s to the present, there's been a dramatic upsurge in the number of films being made in Hollywood about slavery. Amazing Grace, Django, 12 Years a Slave, New Birth of a Nation and others besides. What do the panelists think is driving this? And then following up, um, also making a pitch for a, a CLR James uh, version of the Black Jacobins, which absolutely. I could answer that, but I'd rather hear Dexter first. <laughs> you know, um, that's actually a question that many people have asked because I suppose one of, the one of the things I often have to correct is the notion that there are tons and tons of films on slavery, not when you, and this is a this is a belief, and I think it's come about because there's been an uptick. I think, especially a lot of my younger students, they think that there've just always been films on slavery. And I said, actually, if you're talking especially major blockbusters, there was a time when they came out like once every eight years. Like you could say, Glory, let's wait about eight nine years, Amistad, and so forth. I said, and then there were smaller things you might find on television or PBS. I said, but we actually have had an uptick and. I, I rooted them for several things. One thing I thought actually, I, I wondered if it, because I've seen people ask this question before, Steve McQueen has talked about this. I thought in the beginning, it had something to do with the Obama effect during a certain period where we did start to see films uh, more so pertaining to issues of slavery and race. Um, I thought it also simply had to do with, uh, if we go into political economy, Hollywood realizing it has a diverse audience I think it's one of the reasons we're seeing a diversity in many films altogether. Uh, 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 and, you know, a move away from whitewashing and things that were simply normative about 10 years ago, while we're seeing a, a shift away from that. And so I think, I think that speaks to one of the reasons, but I would still say when you come down to it, when you still ask which films are being made and which are not, it kind of tempers the notion that we're seeing this massive upswing in films on slavery. Um, especially when it comes to films on slavery again by black directors. Uh, many, many black directors will still tell you they're still where Haley Jarima was with Sankofa as far as getting funding, as far as getting distribution uh, for the films they want to make. That's still very difficult. Um, and so even if we've had, if, if we've seen a bit more made, if we think about how many films there are that could be made uh, pertaining to slavery, the amount of stories to be told. In fact, in like the United States is not a film of Frederick Douglass, <laughs> right? Then, and we almost had one, but they decided to make it on Lincoln instead. That film was supposed to be mostly about Frederick Douglass and Lincoln, but they decided to scrap that and just make it about Lincoln. And so I, I think that we have had an uptick. We've had television shows, for instance, like uh, um, Underground, which was phenomenal. Um, but interestingly, those shows don't last long. <laughs> they don't even really get to conclude. And so I, I think when it comes to Hollywood, you know, they go with what is green, what gets greenlit is what seems to be going for the time. And so I think even though we've had an upswing in it, I would not be surprised to see uh, them disappear a bit, especially in our anti CRT and what have you um, uh, atmosphere. And so I think we, we've seen it, we've seen a bit of it for right now because for those reasons that I said, but I, I don't know if we'll, I don't know if that's going to continue. 
<laughs> and again, if you ask a lot of, uh, especially black filmmakers who want to make these films, they'll tell you it's still very hard to get the types of films they would like to tell about slavery uh, made. And so I'll let Alyssa handle this. I'd, I'd love to figure out, I'd love to know if there's an answer. No, I think I'll probably leave it at that. You packed a lot of different answers, um, a lot of different factors into the one question and it's worth still thinking about, but I'll just thank you for that. I can also shift, so we can now shift to an Indian Ocean question. Maybe we'll try and bounce back and forth um, between those. And so here, Rogaya has written, uh, a Canadian anthropologist, anthropologist uh, Janice Bobby, cited Fred Halliday's notion of the anti-languages to say Zar is an anti-language in an Arabic-speaking village. And so to what extent could this be applicable in African presence in Iran? And is it a society set up with a society anti-society sort of within it? Um, I, I'm not totally sure about this notion of anti-language, but I, I guess one thing that comes to mind is um, another dimension of the ritual, which is, is part of the process of identifying the wind spirit. Um, and we, we might identifying it, identify it as a kind of speaking in tongues. Um, because what happens is the person who is afflicted by a wind may start speaking in a language that they don't consciously know. Um, frequently it's cited, you know, someone might speak, start speaking Swahili, or if they don't know Arabic, they'll start speaking Arabic if they don't know Hindi, you know. So um, that's, that's really interesting um, in thinking about the ritual as a kind of relic of, of slavery um, to the extent that many people, many of the practitioners, um, but also until very recently, many descendants of um, enslaved Africans or people who we as outsiders might identify as black did not themselves identify that way. They not only did not really identify as black, but they did not um, associate their ancestry with East Africa because of, well, I mean, I don't, I'm not gonna um, speculate on why that is, but that, that's just a fact. Until very recently, I say, because, and this is something I had wanted to bring up with regard to your last question about a film that, that we might want to, make um, about this history because one of the challenges that I encountered in my own project is that I'm, I'm dealing primarily with films that are made by non-Black filmmakers, not primarily, exclusively non-Black filmmakers. Um, and it's a, it's a pretty anti-Black archive as well. Um, so I, I've been really encouraged by the fact that over the past two years, since 2020 really, um, there's this uh, collective that has emerged. I don't know if anyone is familiar. Um, they're called the Collective for Black Iranians, and they operate primarily through social media platforms, but their, um, their goal um, and the aim of the collective is to communicate stories about the lives of Black Iranians, both in diaspora, but also in Iran itself. And as a result of the labor of this collective, actually there is now um, a lot more identification with um, blackness in Iran itself. I mean, obviously that's not the term that's used, um, but there, there's, there's been, I think we're in the process of seeing something changing um, in the way that people identify in this region more generally, not just in Iran. Um, but to go back to the question about the anti-language and the speaking in different languages, again, I think what, what I find interesting about it is the way that it um, suggests a kind of transmission of a historical past that is not legible in a straightforward way. So, neither the person who is speaking this language, say they're speaking an African language in a different context, neither they um, claim consciously to know this language, nor do the people around them claim to consciously know this language. And yet the language is meaningful, right? It's just not, it, it, it's not operating as a language in the way that we traditionally think about it. 
Um, so that, that's sort of the way I, I'm also thinking about historical memory as transmitting something that is not necessarily legible to, to us in a traditional way. Um, and that, that even sort of works against the kinds of expectations we have for what memory ought to look like in the first place. Thank you so much. So, I mean, unfortunately, we're out of time and I feel like we were just, you know, picking up a new uh, well realm of steam. So um, we're going to have to leave it there broadly. There are a whole bunch of threads. I feel like uh, Mohammed's uh, questions here bring together some of the threads about cultural imperialism, about sort of the, the oral uh, sort of tone of the films, right, with the, the use of contemporary music and films set on plantations. So it's bringing a bunch of these threads together that we unfortunately then do not have the time to unknot and continue to explore. Um, but thank you so much for taking time to join us this afternoon, this morning, um, whatever time it is where you are. Um, we really appreciate it. And I know um, both my own knowledge and the knowledge of uh, our students has been and our community has been greatly enriched by the conversation. So thank you again so much.